Let's pray together. Father, your servant Amos reminds us that many times in our lives we are hungry and we are thirsty for physical food and physical drink. The season of Advent comes upon us. And through that same prophet, you remind us that what our real hunger, our real thirst is, is for your word. Your word of hope, your word of truth, your word of strength, your word of courage for the living of our days. So my deep prayer this morning, God, is that through these moments together, you would speak your word to your people, that you would remove from us the blinders that cause us to not see and the things that would get in the way of us hearing clearly the word that you speak to your people. Help us by your spirit, God, to understand your truth so that our lives can be different because of your truth and for your truth. Speak, Lord, either through me or in spite of me. In the name of Christ, we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. So I want you to come on a bit of a journey with me this morning. I want you to come with me to any road that is on the outskirts of Franklin, Pennsylvania, at night. Maybe it's that stretch of 417 from Dempsey Town to Cherry Tree. Maybe it's Old Route 8 from the Four Lanes down to Seneca Hills. Maybe it's, well, pretty much anywhere on Bradensburg Road. Come with me to one of the roads on the outskirts of Franklin, Pennsylvania. It is an overcast night. It is dark. And you are traveling in a car. You might be driving. You might be riding. But as you're traveling, whatever road you're envisioning in your mind, you come up to a curve in the bend, and you can see just a little bit of a glimmer of light around the curve. Do you have the picture in your your mind? And the closer you get to the curve, the more significant the light becomes. All right? What are you thinking as you see this unfolding? Deer? Okay, that's a possibility. Hadn't thought about that one. What else are you thinking? Something. A car. Maybe a motorcycle, maybe a truck, depending on which road you're on, maybe an ATV or an Amish carriage. Something, as you approach that curve, something is coming, right? The light tells you that something is coming around the bend. Now, that's a pretty good understanding or explanation for what's at the heart of this Advent season. Several people have talked to me, several others have talked to our staff in recent weeks, wondering what is Advent and why do we celebrate Advent? I could spend some time this morning going into the history of Advent, a history that you could very easily discover for yourselves with a little visit to Google. So instead of going and rehearsing the history that you can discover for yourselves, let me circle simply the heart of Advent. The heart of the Advent season is twofold. Number one, it's to gratefully remember moments when someone came one time. And that someone, of course, is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the fullness of God, come to dwell in a baby born in a place called Bethlehem. Advent is the time to remember that to celebrate it, to give thanks for the time when Jesus came the first time. 
And then Advent is also a time to celebrate, to look ahead, to proclaim and affirm that the one who came once will in fact come a second time. It's a time to say, let's remember that there is a bigger power, a bigger purpose, and a bigger plan at work amidst all of the everyday details of our living, and that the one who came once as an innocent, vulnerable child in Bethlehem will come again as the living, reigning Lord of the universe. And when that happens, everything as we know it will change. The heart of Advent is to gratefully remember the someone who came once and to proclaim with energy and affirmation and conviction that that one will come again. And when he comes again, he will bring some things with him. And I want to spend a few weeks here in Advent thinking about what is it that Jesus Christ will bring with him when he comes again. Something's coming is the heart of the Advent season. What is it that comes to you and to me when Jesus Christ comes the second time? Are you with me? That's where we're headed in the days to come. So let's visit a bit more with a prophet that we discovered last week, Isaiah. I shared with you last week that the book of Isaiah itself spans about 200 years, 200 plus years actually, of Israel's history. It's broken down into three different groups, three different time periods, pre-exile, the opening segments. The middle part of it is while the people of God are in exile in Babylonia, and the end of it is when the exile is over and they have come home, okay? Each of those three segments has a prophet connected to it that is in this school that we call Isaiah. Isaiah, the one who actually has the name son of Amoz, is the prophet connected to the first part of the book. So that means that the people of God at this point in time in chapter 2 are about ready to be invaded by Babylonia. Exile is imminent. They will be carried off from their homeland. They will be carried into exile for at least 70 years. And then there'll be this series of events that will have to happen for the exile to be over and for them to return home and begin to reestablish life in Jerusalem, life in the the area that they call home. So in Isaiah chapter 2, the language that Sam shared with us for a a minute ago is a future language. Now I want you to imagine this for a minute. Okay, the the prophet is proclaiming to you that something's coming. If you read chapter one, especially of Isaiah, you hear that what's coming is not good. What's coming is a problem. What's coming is, 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 is heartache and despair and destruction. That's what's coming. But then in Isaiah chapter two, God gives Isaiah a picture. And God gives Isaiah a picture that is beyond this destruction that's on its way. God gives Isaiah this picture of a day, a moment, when everything is going to change. Did you catch some of the language in here? This is what Isaiah saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now remember, Judah is the second, is the, is the southern kingdom of the people of Israel. Its capital is a city called Okay, a few of you are awake. It's called Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the centerpiece. Jerusalem is the town that represents God and all that God is about. God gives Isaiah this vision, this image of what's going to happen at a particular point in time for Judah and for Jerusalem. And the particular point of time is the last days. That's an interesting phrase in the Hebrew. It can easily be translated last days, but it can also be translated in the days to come. Okay? Now, is there a difference? Well, it depends on what you think about the last days. It depends on whether you think about the last days as this cataclysmic moment, or it depends on whether you think that there is this God who is at work and is moving history toward a completion at some point in time, some days down the road. Does it really matter? It really doesn't. 
The point is that Isaiah sees a moment. And when he, and he sees this moment, when Jerusalem, watch this, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. Now that's an interesting phrase. Do you know why? Because if you look at the mountain that Jerusalem is, is, is fixed upon, it is not the highest mountain around. In fact, it's one of the smaller ones. The Mount of Olives that Jesus rides down coming into Jerusalem for Holy Week is taller than the mountain that Jerusalem is sitting on. There are multiple mountains in the area of Israel around Jerusalem that are taller than the, than the Temple Mount. Doesn't matter. Isaiah says there's going to come a moment when that mountain that Jerusalem is seated, is, is seated on will be raised up as the tallest and the chief among all of the mountains. And watch this. When that happens, all nations will stream to it. Now, isn't that interesting? When you hear the phrase all nations, what do you hear? Come on. What do you hear? The world. All nations, not just Jewish nations, not just Israel, catch that? All nations, every nation of the world, whether they acknowledge God in the present or not, there's going to come a time, God says through Isaiah, when all peoples will come to the mountain of God. And when that happens, Scripture says, he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. Scripture says, the law, notice that, notice what it doesn't say, it doesn't say a law, it doesn't say a law among many laws, are you catching this? What does it say? The law, the absolute, unadulterated law that comes from God, whose mountain has been established as the chief among all nations, among all mountains, and to whom all nations will come, the law from that place will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Are you getting a picture here? Are you getting a picture of the fact that what Isaiah sees is a time and a place in history when the mountain of God, and by the way, the mountain of God represents the way of God. The mountain of God and the way of God will be lifted up as chief among all mountains and all ways, and all people will come and, to, and receive the law from the mouth of God himself. And when that happens, things will change. They will beat their swords into plowshares, the scripture says. Their spears into pruning hooks. A plowshare is the main cutting blade on a plow. And what this suggests is that there's, when this moment happens, when the mountain of God is raised up, when all nations come to the mountain of God and God teaches everybody his ways, when that happens, weapons of war will be beaten by a blacksmith into implements to make things grow. Things will change. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. When Isaiah sees this vision, the people of God are about ready to go into exile. And when they go into exile, they're going to think God's forsaken them. Isaiah says, on behalf of God, this is what's coming because of your sinfulness, exile. <laughs> but beyond that, is coming a day when God's way and God's will will be chief among all. All nations will stream to it and receive the instruction of the Lord. Now, what is it that's coming when Jesus Christ returns again? What does Isaiah tell us? 
that when the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ comes with all of its fullness, what is it that Isaiah says to you and to me? What's coming, sisters and brothers? Simply this, God's way wins. Oh, really, preacher? That little bit of drivel is what you have for us this morning? You bet. Because that's the truth of Scripture. The truth of this text from Isaiah. Advent and the coming of Jesus Christ the second time affirms that amidst all of the ways in the world, God's way will be the only one that will stand and the only one that will win when the end comes. Now that is incredibly powerful hope for you and for me. Is it not? Because here's the truth, sisters and brothers. If God's way is the only one that stands and the only one that wins, guess what? There are some things that will not win. You with me? There are some ways in the world that we are living in now that will not win. Can I suggest a few of them for you? Sisters and brothers, when God's way is acknowledged and lifted up and centered as the only way that matters, the way of racism cannot win. Why? Did you catch the language? Who streams to the mountain of the Lord? Certain races? All nations. You get it? Racism can't win. Classism can't win. Gender bias cannot win. Ladies among us, when God's way is complete and God's way is, is fully realized, there will be no glass ceiling. It won't be there. Because all nations and all people will stream to the mountain of the Lord. And the mountain of the Lord will articulate the way of God. And it will be God's way when those moments come. Can I suggest to you, sisters and brothers, that if God's way is the only way that matters and the only way that's going to win, then every type of greed cannot win. Corporate greed cannot win. The abuse of power cannot win. Exploitation of the poor by the wealthy cannot win when God's will is lifted up and God's way becomes the only way that matters. Let me bring it home a little closer to where you are and where we live, sisters and brothers. How many of you realize that we have a pretty serious drug abuse issue in Franklin, Pennsylvania? Would you agree? We have an epidemic of addiction within our community. Can I tell you, sisters and brothers, that when God's way comes in all of its fullness and is lifted up as the only way that matters, drug dealing cannot win. And it will not win. The abuse of people's woundedness by people that have a substance that promises a quick release and a quick fix, that will not win. You sure we're fighting the battle now, are we not? But here's the truth of Isaiah. There will come a day when that battle will be won because of God's way. Let me bring it home a little closer to you. If God's way wins, if the way of God is the only thing that matters, then what your past says about you cannot win. Are you with me? The, the woundedness and the hurt and the mistakes you've made in the past? <laughs> that, that can't win. Hallelujah. It can't win. The struggle, that you, the hopelessness that you might feel in the present moment. Sisters and brothers, if God's way is paramount, God's way wins, God's way is on its way, then the hopelessness of the now cannot ultimately win because tomorrow is promised. A better day because of the way and the will and the, and the purposes of God. Are, are you tracking with me? Do you, do you understand that if God's way wins and is the only one that matters, there's a whole bunch of the ways that we look at in the world today and think, oh, those things are important. They will not win. 
Something's coming, sisters and brothers. And what's coming when Jesus comes with all of his fullness is that God's will and God's way wins. I want to proclaim that to you on this first Sunday of Advent. I want to proclaim it with all the energy I have. And I want you to know that all of you I know are sitting out there right now saying to yourself, Pastor, that's good to know. That's helpful to know. It's, it's encouraging to know. But we got living to do before that moment comes. So what in the world does this truth that there will come a day when God's way and will will be lifted up as chief among them all and will be the only one that matters? What does that have to do with the life I'm living? What does that have to do with the challenges that I'm going to walk out of these doors back into in just a few minutes? What does that have to do? Well, the last verse of the text that we shared gives us a clue. Come, O house of Jacob... Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us walk in the light. What is the light of the Lord? What is that? Is the light of the Lord not the promise that there is coming a day when the mountain of the Lord will be lifted up as chief among all the mountains and all nations will stream to it and the one who resides there will teach everyone his way because his way will be the only one that matters. Is that not the light of the Lord? And if that's the truth, if that's the, what Isaiah proclaims is real, then how ought we to live in the now? We ought to live in that light, right? We, we, ought, we ought to allow Our living now, the things that we call priority, we ought to allow God's priorities to direct our priorities. Because here's the truth, and this is going to hit hard, so if you've tuned out, tune in a little bit. Your priorities and my priorities will not stand when God's time comes. Even if we try to figure out how to work God's priorities into our priorities, only thing that will stand when those moments come is whether or not our priorities flow from God's priorities. Whether or not what God says is important becomes the way that you and I operate, the way that we live our lives, moment by moment and day by day. So what does that look like? Well, I could just cite example after example after example, but let me give you this one. How many of you know that there are different people in the world? (laughs) Surprise! (laughs) There are different people in the world. And let me ask you another question. Do you realize that there are actually, I know this is hard for you to believe, but do you realize that there are actually people in the world that see things differently than you do? Do do, do you get that? We're not all the same. My guess is in this room, we didn't all vote for Trump. We didn't all vote for Clinton. My guess is that, that some of us like turkey and some of us like ham and some of us can't make a decision and offer both on Thanksgiving. You with me? You get the fact that there are different people in the world. And we see things differently. And we experience things differently. And our histories are different. To to live life in the light of the Lord means that you and I engage people who are different than we are from the perspective of what God says about them. You with me? We don't engage people based upon what we think or feel about them. We don't engage people based upon what other people tell us about them. We don't engage people even based upon what they tell themselves about themselves. You with me? If we're walking in the light of the Lord, then we engage every person, even the ones different than we are, based upon what God says about them. Are you with me? Not based upon what we think or feel or what they say, but based upon what God says. 
I said to the late service last Sunday, do you know what the best hope for the drug challenges in our community is? You know what the best hope is? The conversion of those who deal the drugs. Oh, come on, preacher. Really? Yeah. Yeah. If we believe that Jesus Christ can take any life and change it and turn it around, then we have to believe that if God gets a hold of people who are dealing drugs, then that whole scenario can change. Are you with me? And if you and I, sisters and brothers, as the people of God, do not hold that up as the primary goal, then God help us who will. Who will hold it up? Who will say that what people need more than anything in their life is a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because that's where it changes. If we don't say that, who's going to? Who's going to? So, so let me wrap it up this way. It's been, a, it's been a hectic week here at Christ Church. We, we had to say goodbye to two pretty special people this week. Ron DeWoody, Nancy Garmon. It occurred to me as, as I celebrated life, Sam and I celebrated those lives this week, that neither Ron nor Nancy were folk that liked to be where I am today. The center of attention. (laughs) Ron was a very quiet man. I started to think the other day of all the conversations that I had with Ron DeWoody over the years that I was his pastor, he might have said 50 words to me. Maybe. Maybe. And Nancy was never a person that wanted to be out front. She was always a person that was behind the scenes, encouraging, helping, caring, nurturing, loving others. Now, can I suggest to you that that neither Ron nor Nancy reformed any piece of social life in our community? You with me? They, they, they wouldn't be credited for legislation. They wouldn't be credited for some kind of a, of a move in the, in the community that caused us to live our lives a little differently in this community. But can I suggest to you that the kingdom of God is different and the kingdom of God is better and those that connected their lives to those two people are better simply because we got connected to those two people. You, you with me? That... that that maybe, maybe the way to change communities is a whole lot less about reforming and a whole lot more about just revealing by the way we live who God is and how God operates. John Oswald in his incredible commentary on Isaiah says this about Mother Teresa. You remember Mother Teresa? Can you honestly say that the mortality rate in Calcutta dropped because of Mother Teresa's work there? The answer is no. Can you really say that, that, that something legislative-wise in, in that community changed dramatically because of Mother Teresa's work there in Calcutta? The answer is no. But what you can say without, the, without any doubt is that because of the way Mother Teresa lived in the light of her God, there were a whole bunch of people that took notice of her God. And I don't think anybody in this room would say that the world isn't a better place just because Mother Teresa lived in the light of her God. Maybe you and I Maybe you and I change the world not so much by the big reforming ways as as by simply walking in the light of the Lord, as by simply affirming with all that we have that the day is coming when the mountain of the Lord will be lifted high above all mountains and all nations will stream to it. And from that place, God, the only voice that will matter, will teach all nations his ways. And when that happens, and if that's true, 
then you and I are called to simply live in that light and live by that truth as we engage all of life, no matter where we are or what's going on within our lives. So Advent is a time to remember the one who came once, to affirm with all the energy that we have that that one is coming again. Yes? And that when that one comes again, everything as we know it will change. And the way of the Lord will win. And Advent asks us, in the light of those truths, to look deep into our own living. Advent invites us to say, whose way have I been living by? Advent invites us to take a good look at what our living reveals about the way that we say is important, the way that we claim is the most important. Is it our way with a little bit of God mixed in? Or is it God's way? And allowing that way to trickle into every engagement of our lives. Good news is, God's way wins. Amen? Amen? The question is, is your way the way of God? Let us pray. Thank you, Holy One, for your word, for your truth, for your grace and your mercy. Help us to hear clearly, Lord, the truth that there will come the day when your way will be lifted up as the only one that matters. And show us how to live in the light of that truth during this Advent season. In the name of Christ we pray. And everyone said, Amen.